uh, just sort of give you an overview as we approach the end of the, of the century of how I see uh, the evolution of the NFL and where we are today and maybe some of our challenges ahead. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to go through a football season without coming to Chicago because in many, many ways, uh, a lot of the history and the roots of the National Football League are in Chicago. Uh, Canton, Ohio is often called the birthplace of pro football because the organizational meeting in 1920, which led to the league being formed, was held in Canton. However, uh, and I'm sure there are some historians in the room who know this already, the meeting would never would have taken place had it not been for George Hallis. He's the person who was then running the Decatur Staley's, uh, who called the owner of the Canton team and suggested they have a meeting to form a league, and the National Football League was formed in 1920. Ed McCaskey uh, has this most subtle way of giving good advice. You know, as you try to hold things together with these 30, now soon to be 31 owners, sometimes you have a few problems and things, th things start to look like they're coming apart at the seams. And when that is happening, uh, usually I get a call from Ed McCaskey who says, uh, when is the last time you spoke to so-and-so? And I say, well, I don't know, maybe a, a month ago? He says, well, I think it would be a good idea if you spoke to him today. I said, <laughs> I say, about what? He says, I don't care, you decide, you just talk to him today. And he's always right. We always solve a problem. But it's the kind of advice that uh, grows out of intuition. It grows out of knowing the members of the league. It grows out of understanding how to bring people with different perspectives, different values, different interests together. So I use the term chairman of the board with great respect because he is the one who gets a lot of credit for some things that happen magically in the National Football uh, League. As part of all of this, uh, there was a legislation passed by Congress, and I'm certain that very few of, of you have ever focused on uh, the guiding hand of the federal government in professional sports in the way that I'm about to explain. Uh, there is a law which says that the NFL cannot play on Friday and Saturday. So now you know why our games are on Sunday and Monday night. Uh, Congress established in 1961 that Friday was for high school football, Saturday was for college football, and never shall the NFL be on those two days of the week. So there are a few things that government has done successfully in the last 40 years. Uh, but again, this was part of what I think was a, a visionary group of leaders who uh, not only accepted that, but welcomed that type of an accommodation with the sport at the youth level and at the university level. And that partnership continues until uh, today. Uh, Mr. Hallis had a great metaphor for the National Football League, and he used it in the last time he appeared before Congress. He said that the league was like a wheel of a wagon. Uh, and that the league itself and the strong league institutions were the rim and the teams were the spokes. And every spoke had to be the same length, had to have the same opportunity to be part of the wheel, and had to be just as strong as the strongest of all the spokes. And, and only then could we roll along together. I use that metaphor sometimes today uh, when I'm trying to persuade recalcitrant owners and uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think it says a lot about the vision that these owners had who created the league. There's a flip side, however, which I think is just as important uh, to understand uh, uh, in terms of our economic structure. While we have created a league which enables the Green Bays and the Buffaloes and the Kansas Cities and the Jacksonvilles to thrive, we have created a league in which it's harder for the big market teams to dominate. It is harder for Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and others to dominate in pro football because of the equalizing principles that we have in our well, game. Well, you know, I think that the, the one uh, piece of this uh, wonderful debate that is uh, probably the least understood is that uh, 
the teams who are opposed to instant replay are opposed because they think there is a real uh, competitive cost, a, a playing field competitive cost uh, that goes with instant replay that they don't want to uh, bring into the game. And that is that it interrupts the game, it slows down the pace of the game, and in the eyes of many uh, coaches and players, it gives the defense a competitive advantage because a great part of a successful football team is to seize the moment, to get the momentum, to put the defense on its heels, to come to the line of scrimmage quickly, a no-huddle offense, a hurry-up offense, uh, you've seen it with every great team. And instant replay in the eyes of many of those teams uh, interrupts that momentum. Steve Young and Mark Brunell both made the point last week on television. They want to be in control of the game. They don't want a replay official to interrupt it any more than is necessary. We don't allow the networks to put commercial breaks in our games once a team begins a drive. There's no interruption once a drive starts other than injuries and replay. And, that, and, and many people don't understand that's what a lot of the debate is about. Everyone wants better officiating, but some people don't want to pay the price that goes with replay. With, this, with the Cleveland Browns recently going for $550 million, and the Washington Redskins reportedly going for as high as $600 million, and with the spiraling values of teams on the open market, how much influence do you or the league have over the value of franchises? I wish I could take the credit. Uh, I, I think that the value, uh, those values are beginning to reflect uh, sort of the transformation of sports teams in, into media companies in the sense that there is a perception out there that the uh, content and the transmission and retransmission of sporting events is going to be a bigger and bigger part of the entertainment business. If you look at uh, the companies involved in sports today and sports television, uh, Disney owns ABC and ESPN. Uh, News Corp, which is a major entertainment company, owns Fox. Uh, GE uh, owns NBC. Uh, Time Warner, uh, Turner owns uh, the TNT network, which carries a lot of sports. So there's an integration of sports into entertainment, which is creating this enhanced perception of value. On the Cleveland thing, which was an expansion team, I think there's an important point to understand about what the $530 million represents. Uh, the ownership paid $530 million to the league for the Cleveland franchise. The first $54 million of that uh, was invested by the league into the new Cleveland Stadium as the league's contribution to the construction of the stadium. So we ended up with $476 million. But the new team now shares in our television package, so there's a dilution of the television payments to the 30 teams to give Cleveland an equal share. Over the next seven years, we will pay to the Cleveland team out of the pockets of the other 30 teams $497 million in television. So we brought in 476 and we're paying out 497. So when you understand the economics, what you're really talking about is the time value of some money, but you're not talking about a big windfall. Uh, Redskins are a different case. There, it's a privately financed stadium uh, built by Jack Kent Cook, and uh, I think the price is going to be uh, influenced heavily by uh, someone's ego who wants to own a team that he thinks is the, is is America's team, other than the Dallas Cowboys. Jerry, one last question. For the yeah, well, as part of the questions committee, I was asked since I know we were focusing tonight so much on the business of football, and it is, as you pointed out, a multi-billion-dollar business. But for all our, our youth and all the rest of us fans out here, could you talk a little bit about what you see your vision of the future of football as a sport and a thing that fans really fall in love with and, and root for as opposed to just the business side? 
Well, I think that our biggest challenge in many ways is, uh, is maintaining the passion and the fire for the game. Uh, uh, there, are so much, there are so many entertainment uh, options uh, available today. Uh, technology is making everything available to everybody, and, and I'm referring in part to the Internet. Uh, we will, in the next five years, be televising NF ga NFL games in Europe in all likelihood on the Internet. Uh, we already have teams uh, carrying on the Internet uh, video highlights of their daily practice sessions. So I think we have a challenge to uh, keep young people engaged in playing sports, uh, not just football, but all sports. We have a challenge in trying to keep sports uh, as a high priority com as compared to all other entertainment and leisure time offerings. And we have a challenge to keep our teams stable, keep our players stable, and to continue to have players that the public respects. When, I, when I'm asked what our two big, biggest challenges are looking into the next decade, I say there are two of them. Number one is to adjust to, to the technological revolution in terms of how we deliver our game to the public. And number two is to maintain the respect uh, and, uh, with the public that the public has had for NFL players and coaches and teams. And I think we'll do both well. Uh, but I think those are our two biggest challenges. And, and, and we're doing a lot with our players, uh, things that have never been done before. Our teams are working with our players because they are so uh, visible. They live in such an incredible fishbowl. I don't want uh, Eddie McCaskey to tell tales on any uh, players who played for the Bears in the 50s, but I'm sure there were players in the NFL who did some dumb things in the 50s that no one ever read about because it was pre-television, it was pre-24-hour sports radio, it was before we had uh, an entire section of a national newspaper dedicated to, to sports, which is what USA Today is. Uh, so yes, we have issues, but um, I, think, I think we'll deal with them successfully.